Good morning. Welcome to SEC Online again. Um, this morning we're going to open with a reading from Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you so much that it was you that rescued us and saved us from ourselves. Lord, we look forward to being with you. We are privileged to worship you this morning. Uh, wherever we are, pray, God, that you'd be honored with the words that we sing and the mes message that is preached. We love you, Jesus. Amen.
All right, let's pray together. Jesus, that is our prayer. You are our only hope. You have accomplished for us freedom and victory over sin in the grave because you, Christ, overcame. You overcame our greatest enemies, our greatest faults before you, our greatest declarations of independence from God. You, Jesus, bore on yourself all wrongdoing that we might have freedom. We might be pardoned. And I pray that this May long weekend, you would enrich our worship, Jesus, of how great you are, our loving, gracious, conquering King, that we would worship you, our love for you would be kindled anew for how great a Savior you are, that in the midst of all we are going through, in the midst of all we are seeing taking place, there would be this quiet hope that would sustain us and would keep us. I pray, Jesus, that you'd be at work within SCC. Let us be held fast in your gospel as your spirit keeps us, as you keep us with our focus on Christ in the midst of all of these distractions. I pray that we would be a people who cling tight to Christ, cling tight to the cross because you, spirit of God, are keeping us and are gazed steadfast on Jesus. Would you be at work in this service? Let the preaching of your text be preached clearly. Let our hearts be receptive to hear from you. And it is all for your beautiful name and for your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, SCC. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab it and turn to Luke chapter 13 as we carry on in our Encountering Jesus series. My name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Uh, We were joking that this is week two of two, and that's uncommon for me, and so I hope it's okay. I hope you haven't tuned out already so you heard that joke and that we can carry on this morning. Uh, We're going to look at a fairly difficult passage this morning, and one that might not fit the May long weekend theme. You know, we're all kicking back, we got Monday off tomorrow, and yet we're going to look at a text that that might not fit a long weekend, uh, because it causes us to pause and reflect on some hard teaching of Jesus, and yet here's my hope this morning, and whenever you tune in, here's my hope for you. That as you pause and as you reflect, you would understand Jesus and his great love for you and the degree of sacrifice he took to pursue you and save you, and you would understand it anew this morning. As way of introduction here are two questions I want you to start thinking about, and both come with some uh, assumptions and implications. So I'm going to ask two questions, and they come with a great deal of of assumptions you might uh, need to actually understand the question. The first is, are you saved? And the second is, do you think that those who will be saved are few? So both those questions come with a whole bunch of assumptions and implications. Like, you might not even know, saved from what? Like, that's an unfamiliar question, an unfamiliar concept. Will those be saved be few? Those questions and how you think about those questions are really important. Because at the, at the heart of our text this morning, in Luke 13, starting in verse 22, is this question that this man brings. Will those saved be few? And, and that's an important thing for us to consider. What we see happening in Luke 13, and what we saw last week and carrying on, is Jesus not only announcing and declaring and demonstrating this kingdom and the kingdom of God, but now we actually see Jesus urgently pleading with people to strive to enter this kingdom. He's not just declaring what it's about. Now he's urgently pleading with people to be part of this kingdom, to not just be bystanders who know a little bit about Jesus, but who actually don't personally know Christ. We're going to start looking at Luke 13, starting in verse 22. We're going to read down to verse 30. And what we got to see is that what entering the kingdom means is being saved. When you're saved, you're brought into this kingdom, as Jesus mentions here in our text. Let's start reading in verse 22. He, Jesus, went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, 
Lord, open the door to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. There's someone in the crowd saying, Jesus, will those who are saved be few? This is what starts this conversation that Jesus has. And last week, we looked at Jesus explaining that the kingdom of God, it's like a mustard seed that grows and becomes this massive tree. And the implications we saw is that what starts as a small group of disciples actually turns into this massive movement that traverses the globe called the church. But then as Jesus is traveling in all these towns, there's somebody that says, but will those be saved be few? He's asking this question with a bunch of assumptions in mind. The assumptions this man has is also what we Christians would hold as basic uh, tenets to the faith. These are basic truths that he would assume that we would hold. And here's what he presumed. Here's what we would believe is true as found in the gospel. We believe that we were created by God. He is our creator who created us in his image and likeness, as his top delight, as people in whom he wants to establish relationship with and and be with and dwell with. God, we also believe, is holy and perfect and loving. He is without fault. His expectation on his creation is to walk in holiness and perfect obedience as he would have us do. He expects us to maintain the standards he has in place, but then this is what we also believe. We believe, and this man believed, that people, human beings, men and women, have actively rebelled against that holy, perfect, loving God knowingly. Like, we didn't fall into that accidentally. We knowingly rebelled and chose our own way and and exchanged. We pushed off the glory of God, and we ended up pursuing our own glory, our own delights. And as a result, because God is holy and expects us to be perfect and, and, and like he is as far as his absence and, 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 and um, lack of sin, he expects us to be holy as he is, but because we can't, because we aren't, we're under the wrath of God. God is holy, and he cannot be in the presence of sin, and sin is punishable because he is perfectly just. He is perfectly holy, and so we're under this wrath. Why would a loving God hold wrath against people he created? Like, why would God start this whole thing and say, I'm going to create you in my image and likeness and and love you and delight in you, but then I'm going to put you under my wrath? Why? Because love without wrath isn't true love. Like love and delight and pure affection, when you rebel against that, there's this, this, this wrath that's there. I heard it explained this way, that if you were to come at one of my kids and threaten to harm them, my love for those kids would induce this wrath and anger. And that's appropriate, right? A dad's not going to be just be like, all right, do whatever you want. No, that love and that wrongdoing committed against his loved ones creates an appropriate wrath. But in God's sense... He's perfectly holy, without error, without flaw. And the sin that we've committed, it's actually against him. Like, we've taken his holiness and said, no, we know better, we, we see it better, we, our delights are higher. And he says, you've sinned against, therefore you're under my wrath. Because again, he's perfectly just. His creation was meant to bring him worship and glory and honor. Our whole hearts were meant to be set on him as perfectly satisfactory, to delight in him above all else, and yet we chose lesser things. None of us are inherently perfect and holy. We weren't able to worship God the way we were meant. It wouldn't take you very long, any of us, to think this week of something you've said or done that was wrong or that you regret or that you're ashamed of. It wouldn't take us long at all to think of, oh yeah, there's that one thing. And as far as God is concerned, one fault is all that's required, and each one of us have committed far more than one fault. 
So one fault, deserving of the wrath of God, and then this is what we also believe to be true. God in his justice, being holy and perfect, will demonstrate wrath against all wrongdoing, all If you think about that for a moment, if there was no perfectly just creator, think of all the injustice and the wrongdoings that are committed that would go unpunished. The things that aren't found out, the things that aren't pardoned for, the things that aren't asked for forgiven over, all of these injustice. But God, the perfect creator, says, no, I will hold all to account for all wrongdoing in his perfect justice. But if that perfect holy creator promises retribution for all wrongdoing and and promises wrath against wrongdoing, we understand again, he is perfectly just. We've sinned against the only holy creator there is. That wrath, we also believe, was graciously paid for in full by Jesus, that we might not fear that punishment anymore because there's no more debt to be paid for those who believe. This is the good news. This weekend's going to be a bit heavy. We're going to talk about hell and wrath of God because this is what Jesus is getting at in this text. Will those be saved be few? Will there be those who think they are and they're cast out? But the gospel, which is the good news we hold to, is that in the midst of that wrath, Jesus enters the scene and says, I will take that punishment on myself. All of that man's wrongdoing, all of that woman's wrongdoing, I will put on myself and bear the full wrath of God in their place. That's the gospel. But good news isn't good news if there's no bad news associated to it. Good news is in the face of bad news. And the bad news is that all of us are in need of being saved because all of us have committed wrongdoing against the holy, perfect God. That's what being saved is. The perfect deserved justice we had coming our way that we earned was completely paid for by Jesus. Those who receive that substitution on their behalf, they're saved. Those who don't believe Christ paid their debt and those who don't receive Christ, those who don't know Christ, they're still under the wrath of God, still owing to God. One way or another, the wrath is poured out. Your wrongdoing and my wrongdoing, that wrath is poured out either on me eventually by God or it's been already paid on my account by Christ on the cross. That's the distinction between saved and unsaved. So here in this passage, this man asks Jesus a theoretical question. He says, well, which number will be greater? Will the number of those who are saved be greater or those who are unsaved? Which is the bigger group? And Jesus sidesteps the question and personally goes after the heart of this, of this individual. He personally goes after their heart. Instead of asking whether a few will be saved, Jesus spins the question and says, will you be saved? Look back at Luke 13, verse 25 to 27. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know you or where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. This is a chilling passage of scripture. Like, this is a really hard teaching of Jesus, what Jesus just taught was there will be people standing outside the kingdom of God waiting and expecting to get in who won't. They'll be waiting with anticipation, knocking on the door and say, hey, Lord, open the door to us. And he won't. Expecting them to be in on the basis of anything other than knowing Jesus because his answer as to why they won't get in the kingdom is Jesus didn't know them. They will respond that, no, but we, we, we ate and drank with you. Like you taught in our streets. We were with you. We were in proximity to you. We know what you're about. And Jesus will say, but he will deny them entrance because he doesn't know them. There's so much I could say on this. There's so much, but I want to give just two points at this point. The first is this. If you've attended SCC in the past, you've likely heard a lot that we're pretty resistant to the term religion. And the reason why we're a little bit resistant to that term is because it's easy to be an adherent to a certain religion and have a belief system that doesn't impact your life whatsoever. It's a religion you abide by, but nothing that affects and transforms your life. And in the instance of this passage, religion would be people who identify as Christians, but they themselves personally don't know Jesus. 
They've shared meals with Christians. They've heard sermons in the past. They may have even read the Bible. But in their heart of hearts, there is no desire to know Christ. Why? Because what they're adhering to is cold, dead religion. It's just a a system of belief that doesn't transform the heart. That's opposed to what we would understand as a Christ follower or a disciple of Jesus who actively desires to know Christ more, whose affections for Jesus is slowly and subtly increasing, whose time spent with Christ over the course of their life deepens. He becomes your primary joy in incremental, increasing way. But if someone who just adheres to the Christian religion There's no affection for Christ. It's just I'm a Christian on a piece of paper, and that's all it is. It's a checkbox. And Jesus says here, the difference is those who know about Jesus. This is my second point. The difference is those who know about Jesus and those who actually know Christ. John 17, verse 3 says this. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. If you're looking at to what is eternal life, it's those who know Jesus personally, those who know Christ. Matthew 7 puts it this way. It's the same text, but just put in different words. I want to read it. Matthew 7, verse 13 to 23. It'll be on the screen here in a moment. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing and inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can diseased trees bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. You'll recognize who? Mainly false prophets and presumably those who are bearing good fruit. So then listen closely to what Jesus says next in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Just pause for a moment. May long, I get it. This is not fitting at all thematically for the weekend we're in. But think for a moment. There should be times in the life of a disciple where we stop and consider, do I know Christ? Does my life demonstrate that I know Christ? Or is my life just filled with me doing stuff for Jesus but not actually knowing him? There are some watching right now who it wouldn't take long to admit, I I don't know Christ personally. I don't pray to Christ with love and affection in my heart. I I don't consider myself a a person in need of saving. In in Matthew 7 and Luke 13, Jesus is saying, there are those who think they're saved and aren't, and there's also those who aren't saved and know it. Both those groups of people end up in the same spot. Both those groups of people are thrown outside, thrown into fire, thrown into darkness, all of which paint a picture of what we understand to be as hell. John Piper, in his book, In Our Joy, says, the alternative to entering by the narrow gate is destruction. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. In other words, What is at stake when Jesus demands that we strive to enter is heaven and hell. This is an ultimate issue. Back to Luke 7, 28 down to 30. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first, and first will be last. The doctrine of hell is not a hidden doctrine in Scripture. 
This is not a theology that we can say, well, there's a couple ways to interpret who God is and what he does. This is not that ambiguous in Scripture. All throughout the New Testament and the whole Bible, the, the writers write this pretty clearly. I'm going to rattle off five passages really quick. Don't turn there again. You'll, you'll spark a flame in your Bible. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, and then 20 and 21. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what is done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting means forever, eternal. Revelation 20, 12 to 15, my last text. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. At the end of the day, there are two groups of people. That's it. The end of the day boils down to two groups of people. Those who know Jesus and have found life in him, who are saved, who are in the kingdom, and those who are outside. There is no middle ground. There's no leaning toward being saved, but not quite there. It's a clear-cut line. Those who know Christ and have been saved, those who don't know Christ and have not been saved. Penn and Teller, if you've watched um, Fool Us, it's on Netflix, and Penn and Teller are these magicians in Vegas, and, and Penn Jillette is an is a outspoken atheist. Penn, after one show, went outside of his show and a man came up to him and said, man, your show was so great. You did such a good job and your tricks were incredible. And said, I know you're a pretty outspoken atheist, but I just want to tell you that, that God truly does love you. And whether or not you accept that or deny that, he loves you. And he said, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hand you this Bible. Penn was in his hotel room and he was reflecting on that, on that occurrence and he was pretty moved by it. So this man was genuine. He truly loved me. He could sense it. Penn later said this, this quote, which is pretty profound. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it could make it socially awkward, and atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize, who say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you, and this is more important than that. Scripture is so clear. Jesus' penalty that he absorbed on, his, on himself was out of immense love for you, out of immense care for you. And he said, I'm going to take that penalty on myself, that they don't need to walk in the guilt and the shame and the fear of punishment because I've taken it on myself. Elsewhere in scripture, it says there's no fear in love because love casts out fear. In the love of God as seen in Christ, the wrath of hell was absorbed by Jesus. That For the Christian, there's no penalty to fear. No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But if you're listening and tuning in and you've followed the, until this point, and you don't know Christ personally, you've never put your faith in his merit, not your own. 
and pleaded, I need forgiveness of all the stuff I've done, the wrongs committed. If you're not there, there's wrath of God still over you, Scripture would say. But hear this morning, hear this. There is such life and grace held out for you in a, just a grasp. And what my prayer is this weekend is you hear and listen twofold. One, we would pause and reflect, do I know Christ or just know about him? And secondly, there would be people who say, I, I, I haven't heard this, I haven't adhered to this, but your eyes would be open to the immense love of Jesus towards you. And your life would be forever changed in a moment when you understand this perfect love of God on your account. Do you know him? Do you know Christ? Let me close with this paragraph from Francis Chan in his book, Erasing Hell, and then I'll pray for us. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. This is the same wrath that will ultimately be satisfied either in hell or on the cross. We deserve it. Christ endured it. How could I keep from bursting out in joy? While hell can be a paralyzing doctrine, it can also be an energizing one, for it magnifies the beauty of the cross. Hell is the backdrop that reveals the profound and unbelievable grace of the cross. It brings to light the enormity of our sin and therefore portrays the undeserved favor of God in full color. Christ freely chose to bear the wrath that I deserve so that I can experience life in the presence of God. How could I keep from singing, crying, and proclaiming his indescribable love? Let me pray for us, and then we're going to sing another song. Oh, Father, you are good. You are perfectly holy. You are altogether different than we are. There is no error, no flaw, no shortcoming within you. You are perfect. And this week have, has had myriad of examples of, of, of my shortcoming, my sin, my need for Christ. And once again, I thank you, Jesus, that in your grace you pursued us in the cross and said, Jordan's sin will no longer hang over his head, no longer hang over his heart. I will bear it on myself that he can walk free. That is unfathomable. But you, Christ, took on the full wrath of God that we might have life and life abundant. I thank you. And I pray, Jesus, in your powerful name, that there be people who would hear of the grace and love held out for them in the message of the cross. Hearing that question, will those be saved be few? You, Jesus, spun it around and said, will you be saved? And I pray, God, that there would be some who profess faith in Jesus even for the first time this weekend. Jesus, for our church, let us be filled with people who understand the weight of hell and therefore the weight of the cross and how substantial it is in our life. Might we never cease thanking you, Jesus, for your accomplishment on our behalf on the cross and what you did for us. We love you, we worship you, we thank you, and like the quote said, how could we stop from bursting in joy knowing that our punishment has been paid for in full? I pray that you be worshiped now in our midst. It's in your name we pray, amen.
this weekend, and I just want to say how much we love our church here in Salmon Arm, SEC. We miss you guys so much and worshiping with you. Um, if there's anything that stood out to you, uh, maybe you haven't met Jesus yet, and uh, we would just love to speak with you. Uh, there will be an email uh, in front of you on the screen. Um, better yet, um, call out to Jesus. He wants to know you and to be close to you, wants to be your father and your friend. Um, our benediction comes from Revelation chapter 1, a second part of verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Bless you guys. <laughs>